on there we got very much sound okay is it okay okay because I hear we'll try again ladies and gentlemen welcome to this seminar on Russian uh, arms exports which we co-organize with the Norwegian defense research establishment my name is uh, Helge Blokkesru. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and uh, the head of the research group on Russia, Asia and international trade here at NUPI. And I have the pleasure to chair the seminar here this afternoon. Russia has for many years been the world's second largest arms exporter. Since 2010, uh, the Russian arms industry has tried to uh, accommodate an unprecedented surge uh, in domestic demand while at the same time maintaining high uh, export figures. Overall, the, the industry has been quite successful at this, although some critics claim that the sector is not really prepared for the techn technological challenges ahead. Moreover, some recent uh, uh, reports from CIPRI suggest that Russian arms sales may now be in long-term decline. What is the future of Russian arms exports? What production capabilities, customers and export policies will Russia have uh, for maintaining its exports in the years to come? To shed some more light on this, uh, these questions, we have invited two of uh, Russia's leading experts uh, in this uh, field, Ruslan Pukhov and Konstantin Makienko from the independent Moscow-based think tank Center for Analysis and Strat of Strategies and Technologies, COST. The order here today will be that uh, we'll start with uh, Ruslan having a presentation. He will go on for uh, about 25 minutes, followed by a short intervention from Konstantin. And then uh, Una Haklog, research fellow at uh, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment, will uh, give uh, a prepared comment before we open the floor for comments and questions to our panelists. I would like to remind that uh, today's event uh, is being streamed online. Uh, and I would also like to welcome our online viewers. But without further ado, I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Ruslan Pokhov. Please. Thank you very much. Um, it's a big honor and privilege to be here at NUPI. We've, for many years, we've heard about uh, this established, well-established institution, but never had chance to be invited here. Uh, so thank you for giving us this excellent opportunity. I also would like to thank uh, FFI for being with us almost for a decade as our uh, partners, as subscribers to our magazine and also for co-organizer of this seminar. Um, just two words uh, about uh, CAST. Uh, CAST is a privately owned think tank which was established in Moscow 22 years ago by me and by my colleague Konstantin Makienko right after graduation from Moscow State Institute of International Relations, we decided to uh, create our own institute. We had CIPRI at that time uh, as a model in the hand. With the time we failed uh, to become Russian CIPRI, probably because CIPRI already exists, but uh, we created CAST. Uh, during these 22 years, uh, we expanded our research activity, but our main focus uh, and our major expertise stays the same. This is the defense industry and arms trade, conventional defense industry. We publish for years a magazine slash bulletin about arms trade, and uh, we regularly do a book. This is the fresh book which was uh, uh, published at the end of the last year about global arms trade. Uh, Konstantin is the editor of this book, and uh, most of our findings, uh, findings which I present you today, we, we publish them on a regular basis in our, uh, in our publications. Yeah? Another point, uh, CAST is different, let's say, from CIPRI arms trade program. We don't see uh, that uh, arms trade is evil in itself, as many of our colleagues. We consider that arms trade 
It's a legitimate business, like many others. Uh, it's need regulation, it's need transparency, but uh, this is not something like venereal disease as some of our Western colleagues like to claim. Yeah? So we don't uh, add value judgment to this business, neither in positive nor in negative. Yeah? I uh, very often like to refer to the phrase of late uh, great designer of small arms, uh, Soviet small arms, uh, Mikhail Kalashnikov. For many years he was uh, asked, especially by foreigners, are you sleeping well at night? So many people were massacred with the help of your invention. He said, I created my weapons to, pro to defend my country. And if irresponsible politicians in certain countries uh, used it to massacre innocent civilians, it's not my fault. I sleep very well at night. Same with us. Yeah? On this high note, uh, I, uh, I pass to my presentation and uh, happy to uh, answer your questions. Um, at the end. So, uh, as for uh, Russian, as for Russian statistics, we can all this uh, operate with several figures. Uh, the main figure which countries operate this is deliveries, how much weapons of va of value. Yeah, this is the difference with CIPRI. CIPRI counts number of cannons. We try to count money as much as it can. We count economical impact less the impact on security. This is the figures of uh, Russian deliveries for last, the period of the last uh, four years. And uh, we should say that uh, for the time being we see some kind of saturation of the market. If for almost two decades uh, Russian uh, deliveries of Russian weapons was uh, going up, now we can uh, give a pure constatation that now it's on some kind of plateau around uh, 15 uh, billion euros dollars annually. Yeah? Another important figure for all arms trade uh, studies, this is the, what we call contract portfolio. It's how many uh, contracts signed per year and for what sum. Obviously, you can sign lots of small contracts or you can sign a big mega contract as uh, Russia once signed for delivery of aircraft carrier to India and it gives you a peak. Yeah? That's why this, the, the figures which shows uh, how different from year to year can be expert portfolio, um, portfolio of orders. Yeah? This is not that relevant for our presentation, but I want you to understand uh, from which figures uh, Russia after the collapse of Soviet Union was starting. Some of these figures, especially the figures of, uh, of 92, 93, 94, are of partial relevance. First of all, because at that time there was no viable statistics and Russia was in a transition from planned economy to market economy. Yeah? Some of these dollars were in fact not uh, real currency, but it was either commodities or goods, consumer goods uh, from China, which was counted in dollars. That's why some of these figures are also can be misleading when we're uh, doing the analysis in retrospect. We always like to say in Russia that after the collapse of Soviet Union and uh, record of uh, modern Russia at the very end of 90s, um, when internal procurement was not very big, Russia survived due to two big foreign customers. One was China and another one was India. India was twice as important because if Chinese at that time preferred to buy almost off the shelf, what Russians produced, Indians were was also asking us to develop something more sophisticated on the base what we had. The classical example is uh, Su-30 family aircraft. At the beginning there was no Su-30, there was Su-27 B+, plus, yeah, double seater, where the pilot, young pilot and instructor basically sits. Indians uh, managed to 
pass the message that they don't need a simple double seater trainer, but they need a sophisticated machine. And instead of interceptor, we created a multifunctional aircraft, which is at the same time interceptor, ground attacker. It also uh, can uh, do reconnaissance missions. By the way, this is also one of the reasons why uh, Russia is lagging behind in targeting pods. Soviet concept was not one aircraft like French for many missions, but one aircraft for one mission. Su-25 ground attacker, MiG-29, Su-27 interceptor, bomber, AVEX, you know. You so expert uh, clients, in a sense, forced us to think alternatively. Yeah? And how, for example, this uh, successful family of Su-30 aircraft was delivered. And on the basis of Su-30, we have uh, the most performant uh, aircraft in Russian inventor and in Russian expert, uh, Su-35 now. This is all the further development of, of, of this Indian, um, Indian paradigm, let's, let's call it like this. So for many years, India was a big customer, important customer in terms of finance and in terms of, let's say, philosophy, let's put it like this. But uh, until October 2018, uh, for almost period of six years, we had a pause. There was no major contracts. Indians uh, uh, was not contracting big uh, new platforms, only certain type of follow-ups and service. Yeah. As we can see, uh, this was very uh, dramatic period in Russian-Indian relations because when you see Russian-Indian relations, uh, apart from defense industry cooperation and arms trade, there is a little bit of cooperation in nuclear. We construct power stations. And then a political dialogue. Then we are speaking about Russian-Indian relations. What is the substance of these relations? Yeah. Arms trade is very important uh, substance. In October 2018, we had uh, a return of India with uh, several big contracts, including uh, the contract for current Russian bestseller S-400 air defense system. Causes of stagnation or saturation. Uh, we, at CAST, uh, managed to detect two uh, important reasons when people buy armament and at what period of time. And it's not only about Russian armament, but in general. It's either high prices for oil and gas or certain other commodities, but they are rarely, or uh, strong economic growth for almost two decades. Let's look Poland. After the collapse of Warsaw Park Pact, Poland start massive purchase of new weapons almost 20 years after, yeah, 2016, that Constantine, 2006, 2007. So for 15, 16 years of steady economic growth, then you can spend certain amount on defense. When we are speaking about other countries, oil bonanza gives you possibility to buy. And that was exactly the uh, reason why Venezuela, apart from political uh, preferences, uh, start to buy weapons at that period of time. They simply could afford themselves. As many other countries, look, Qatari's mega contract, look, uh, Saudi's, and, and many countries which has these extra revenues in oil and gas. Now, with... Uh, if not collapse uh, of oil prices, but not that high oil prices, Venezuela cannot afford to buy, and it, start, it stopped to buy, stopped contracting new, um, uh, new weapons, uh, new weapon system, even before they, f they are facing this uh, internal crisis. As we all remember, Russia supported UN embargo uh, on Iran, and Iran uh, can buy only defensive weapons 
like air defense, but main battle tanks, fight aircraft, and many other sophisticated systems, uh, it cannot buy. These sanctions would be lifted in a natural way uh, in October next year, and uh, this is probably the only market which waits, in a sense, for Russian and Chinese uh, offers, because neither Europeans nor other countries uh, will not come there. Uh, for many years, uh, arms market looked uh, very static. There were majors and were a little bit of newcomers. But now countries like uh, Turkey, like uh, South Korea, have lot, lots to offer. But I don't think it would be an Iranian case. So Iran, it's not only a problem for the time being, but it's also an opportunity for Russian arms producers and arms traders. Destruction of Libya. So the end of Gaddafi regime brought us to the end of the statehood in Libya, civil war, spread of extremism. And, but this country was about to start contracting a uh, uh, very big number of uh, heavy and expensive systems. There are different uh, evaluations, estimations from 2 billion up to 8 or even 10 billion what Russia lost in Libya. Syria, before bloody civil war started, was also one of the important clients. Sometimes it was number five, number four, number six, and uh, was paying. Now Syria is a netto recipient of military aid. Syria doesn't pay. New markets. Uh, after 90s and beginning of uh, 2000, China also had some kind of pose in purchasing uh, of Russian weapons, but last five, three years, uh, China start to buy again. Apart from engines, there was big contract for Su-35 uh, multifunctional aircraft and for S-400. There are also other contracts in the a, uh, in a pipeline discussed, but in general, uh, China and Russia do their best uh, not to advertise before delivery started. Iraq is an extremely interesting case. Uh, after American invasion of Iraq and occupation of this country, if someone would have told that Iraq would be buying Russian weapons, we would probably say that the hair will appear here, but it will never happen. But it happened again. I think uh, there are several reasons we can a lot discuss why Iraqis are buying uh, from us. And they do it for several reasons. First of all, to diversify uh, their source, not to buy only from United States and from the West. For example, they was buying uh, advanced jet trainers from Czech Republic, probably the only client of current Czech defense industry for non-small uh, arms and light weapons. Some, they prove to be simple and deadly. Probably not that cheap as it used to be, but still reliable, good platforms. For example, air defense, like Panzer. Second miracle is Egypt. In fact, uh, there are lots of um, speculations about personal chemistry between President ASCC and Vladimir Putin, and that's why Egyptians buy. It's a simplification. In fact, starting from Hosni Mubarak time, uh, last 10 years of Hosni Mubarak, uh, Egypt was buying from Russia. And every year, more and more. If it started from roughly 100 million, by the end of uh, Mubarak, it almost came to 1 billion, 800 uh, million US dollars. Then President Morsi also came and discussed weapon. Uh, systems, and then RCC. That's why Egyptian uh, miracle is not that miracle. It's, uh, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a trend. I think Egyptians being uh, several times uh, subject of sanctions from the West, they do a rational choice. When we look at their fleet of uh, combat aircraft, it's basically one-third US-made, one-third French-made, and now one-third Eastern technologies. Used to be Chinese, used to be Soviet, now Russian again. The real miracle is Turkey. 
country with which we had almost at the brink of the military exchange suddenly came and offered the most sophisticated system from Russia and keep resisting uh, Trump's will uh, to abolish this deal. I personally not that optimistic. I think that Erdogan, if he thinks that uh, this is important and profitable for him, uh, he can easily cancel it, but until recent time, Turkey repeatedly uh, insists on the fact that it will buy, that this is a matter of national sovereignty, it's a matter of pride, and so on and so forth. And Saudi Arabia. Um, it's also a long story, to, but to put this story short, uh, the first contacts with Saudi Arabia started uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union. There was some ideas, but then first Chechen war started, then second Chechen war started, and uh, they basically refused uh, to discuss these issues for the solidarity reason. Then uh, Saudi Arabia was behind uh, anti-Assad rebel groups at the earlier stage um, of civil war in Syria, but later on, when it was clear that due to intervention of Russia, uh, so uh, Assad uh, will stay at power. Uh, they came and start to buy. We at CAST think that basically uh, by buying weapons from Russia, they repeat more or less the same model when they mainly buy from US as a main protector of this uh, country, at least until the recent times. But then they buy a little bit from the others. Yeah? They buy a little bit from French, they buy from Britain, and from certain uh, countries which has voice. So in a sense, they are buying um, a right to come and ask about favor. Yeah? Uh, this, is an, this is not a weapon purchase in itself. They can buy it and put it in stock. This is something else. It's a Saudi way to do foreign politics. Yeah? So, we already discussed the uh, return of China. The interesting thing, this is not only the concrete uh, purchase from China, but from trade with China, we really come to defense cooperation. The first contract with China was signed under Gorbachev. I think in 1991 or 89, right after Tiananmen events. The first Russian-Chinese military exercises started in 2005, 16, 17 years after. Now we are at some kind of other stage. Uh, we are not military allies, but we basically give an oath that we never again we, and we never would be with someone against each other. It does not mean that we are together against someone, but we never will block uh, with someone against each other. And this is, to our mind at cast, this is a new stage in the cooperation between uh, Russia and China, and this is an extremely important achievement, probably for the first time in uh, Russo-Chinese uh, history. Basically, this uh, chart is partially relevant to our uh, discussion, but uh, it's not official data. It was a leakage in Commerçant newspaper. It simply gives you the idea of diversification, how, how diverse was Russian arms export in 2014. We don't see any dominant client. You know, Basically, the eggs, they are in different baskets. A new phenomena. Um, if in Soviet time arms trade it was a continuation of foreign policy, at the beginning of 90s and in the majority of 2000, years 2000, it was in a sense foreign trade with elements of foreign policy. Now we have a balanced return to the paradigm. Then Russia is not only selling to those who can give hard currency, Russia is also selling to those who it's military allies. Yeah? The most performance systems uh, sold to Armenia. This is the uh, Iskander uh, 
uh, missile and uh, Su-30 to Kazakhstan. This is very interesting uh, presentation by my colleague Konstantin Makienko. He will probably elaborate further about it. That apart from saturation with big systems, because clients cannot buy big systems uh, in the same pace as they used to do during the Cold War, there are certain, uh, how should I put it, not good trends, let's put it uh, in that way, uh, in Russian offers. Many people come to the market with a more sophisticated offer than Russia. The yeah, this is phenomenon of last five years. The classical thing, this is the Russian uh, anti-tank missile Cornet. Cornet is the real bestseller. Cornet was sold to more than 25, probably 30 countries. Yeah. This is more, I think, more wildly spread uh, than Kalashnikov assault rifle produced in Russia. But it's still second generation, it's not far I forget. And if three years ago, five years ago, there was only one offer, or one and a half, including Spike and Javelin, now almost five countries offering far and forget. And we are still pitching uh, the previous generation. Yeah. We also can speak about Ayeza Radar. Uh, Ayeza used to be exclusive offer, let's say, 10 years ago. Now it's a standard offer. And Russia, at least on the platforms, MiG-29 platforms, all this uh, offering uh, the models with mechanical scan, which is completely obsolete for, uh, for nowadays. The same story with uh, conventional submarines. Thanks God Americans are not producing conventional submarines because otherwise they would have keep uh, uh, at least half of the market as they do with their F-16. But air independent propulsion, which was an exotic thing 10, 15 years ago, now it's also kind of standard offer. Russia doesn't have working uh, air independent propulsion. And we think that sooner or later it will be against us. We already lost a couple of tenders uh, for submarines. One, the most uh, painful was in Indonesia. But in other, uh, in other cases, will, will also come. Interesting thing. Um, for many years, uh, Russian authorities was developing a narrative that Americans are trying to block uh, our arms sales. I don't know whether Americans was uh, blocking or it was Russian perception of things, but for sure after implementation of Kaatsa regime, for a very short period of time, we have at least three major cases uh, where the deals was broken. Kuwait refused to buy Russian T-90 main battle tanks. There are big delays with payment uh, with Indonesia for Su-35. And Philippines openly said that we are unable to pay due to the Katsa regime and we will not be buying Russian helicopters. We think would be more to come. So as a resume, we already discussed Katsa. We discussed oil prices. And there is also another thing which was well represented in the chart of Konstantin Makienko, in the table of Konstantin Makienko, that Russian weapons, which was simple, deadly, sometimes cheap, reliable, and at the top age, 20 years back, 10 years back, now is starting to lagging behind, due to several reasons. Uh, much less uh, investment in basic, uh, in basic research, um, also, in general paradigm, uh, I was reading a review. It was a poll, internal poll in Boeing. 90% of Boeing engineers does not want that their son or daughter will be engineered Boeing. It's not any more cool to be weapon designer, and not only in Russia, also globally. It's cool to do something else. Something which was considered to be extremely important, noble, now it's not, in 21st century, not knowable, and, uh, and it gives impact on, on any country, including Russia. 
So on this high note, uh, I would like to say thank you, and probably Konstantin Makienko will say a couple of words. Ну, может быть, по поводу того, что продается красота и вот это, нет? We always like to joke that uh, there is, when, when uh, people are buying cosmetics, they are buying not cream, they are buying beauty, yeah? That's why when people are buying weapons, at least from Russia, they are not only buying weapons, they are not only buying defense, but they are also buying a uh, success story uh, People can differently treat Vladimir Putin, but we definitely know that this is an example of the leadership. Yeah? When you're looking at Britain, at Theresa May, Boris Johnson, you can like or dislike them, but this is not the example of leadership. And in a sense, in the weapons, people tend to buy from the countries where there is a leadership. Probably the best tank uh, for the correlation money Lethality, it's a uh, leopard, but the main bestseller on the world is T90. Yeah, and this, it's also, it's slightly less measurable than the previous things. That's why we decided not to put it into our whole presentation, but it also plays. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Konstantin, for this overview. Uh, Konstantin will join us later when we have the uh, Q&A. But as for now, I'd give the floor to Una Hakwag, who will uh, provide some comments on, on the presentation. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you, Ruslan, for providing valuable insight into uh, the Russian arms export. Um, I think that the work that uh, you do at CAST when it comes to collecting data and analyzing the situation in within the Russian defense industry is uh, quite unique and it's an important contribution to a knowledge-based debate uh, on these topics in Russia and abroad. In your presentation, you identified uh, some current trends in Russian arms export. Uh, and one of the main points that you made was that after a period of growth, uh, Russia's arms export in the last five, six years seems to have hit some sort of ceiling. And this trend has also been uh, pointed out by others. Uh, CIPRI, for example, noted in their latest arms transfer database update that uh, the volume of Russian arms export was 70% less in the, last, in the period 2014 to 2018 compared to the previous five years. Um, as you said, uh, this um, stagnation situation, uh, at least in financial terms, may not, um, may not necessarily be that worrying uh, because uh, um, the financial value of the Russian arms export seems to have stagnated at a historically pretty high level. Uh, and furthermore, uh, Russian defense companies keep signing new contracts. In most years, as we saw from your slides, uh, the, the value of the contracts have ex exceeded the actual value of, of the export uh, that year. Uh, and Although there has been a significant uh, decrease in Russian export to some traditionally important markets, Russian exporters ha have, as you s uh, show in your presentation, to a large extent been able to replace them. Uh, and I think the decrease in new contracts in the Middle East uh, is uh, particularly important in this aspect because uh, the Middle East is the fastest growing market when it comes to demand for, for arms globally. Those, uh, from a commercial perspective, uh, I think we can agree that um, there are no current crises for the defen Russian defense industry as a whole. Uh, this, however, is not the same as saying that uh, there, are, there are not some sectors within the Russian military industrial complex that may be struggling. Um, and maybe some sectors may be struggling more than others. Uh, and this may have security implications uh, for Russia. Export supports defense industrial production in areas where domestic demand may not be sufficient to maintain uh, production lines. And in this way, it helps uh, preserve a wider spectrum of uh, production that would otherwise be possible. Uh, and I therefore thought it would be interesting uh, to hear more about which um, trends you see when it comes to Russian export of different categories of weapons uh, within this broader export picture. Um, other sector where the total production due to um, lack of demand for on, on the export market is falling below critical lines. Uh, and related to this also, 
how do you think the decrease uh, in the domestic demand that is expected to that we are expected to see following let's say 2020 or so uh, may affect this broader picture looking at the long time perspective for russian arms export, uh, you mentioned a number of internal uh, and external challenges, such as decreased global competition, uh, falling oil prices, uh, sanctions, and also the Russian innovation climate. Um, and to this we could probably add that many of the world's major arms import countries are uh, striving to become less dependent on one source of weapons. Um, or one yeah, source of weapons. Um, uh, and with rega regard to this um, aspect, I find um, your example of India very interesting. Uh, because I think uh, a number of these uh, different factors are uh, present at the Indian market. Um, and, and I wonder, um, it would be interesting to have your assessment of to what extent do you see um, when Russia loses, um, loses offers in the, in the Indian market, to, to which extent is it due to an Indian desire to become less dependent, for example, on Russian um, Russian uh, defense companies, uh, relative to the importance of other factors such as uh, uh, Russia's um, the Russian defense industry's uh, challenges uh, with keeping up with the latest technological developments. Um, also, one of the future challenges that you pay attention to in your presentation is uh, the latest U.S. Uh, sanctions. Um, and you mentioned uh, there were some tenders in, uh, or some problems in with payment from Indonesia and uh, and uh, in Kuwait. Um, uh, and then I thought it would also be interesting to hear your assessment of whether or not. Um, um, the U.S. sanction or the threat thereof <laughs> on third-party countries is likely to affect um, Russian trade with like, their major arms trade partners, such as India and Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and maybe even the S-400 uh, deal that you mentioned with uh, Turkey. Um, in your presentation, you mainly focus on what we may call the commercial side of Russian arms export. Uh, but there are obviously also a political uh, side to this. Um, as I have already mentioned, export is important in order for Russia to be able to keep producing a wide range of weapon systems. Thus, it is um, arguably a precondition for Russia to keep its status as an independent uh, military great power. Uh, arms export is also socioeconomically important uh, in Russia and to Russia's political leadership, since it allows factories to keep uh, running in times when the domestic demand is uh, lower than it has been for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and seen from the Russian political leadership uh, perspective, arms export is part of the fundament of Russia's claim to great power status um, and one of the tools they use in the for foreign policy uh, abroad. Uh, and I think while um, from a commercial perspective, Russian arms export may not have hit a crisis uh, at the time being, there are a few sign uh, worrying signs um, from uh, looking at it from the side of the Russian political leaderships. Um, first, um, as Ruslan mentioned, uh, there are signs that Russian defense industry is struggling to be competitive, both with regard to cost and technology. Uh, and second, um, the, recent the recent stagnation in Russian arms export has happened at a time when the global demand for weapons has increased, and Russia is uh, therefore has uh, lost their position in the market. Um, if you look at the data from CIPRI, Russia was uh, only two out of the 10 uh, world leading um, arms uh, exporters that did not see an increase in their portfolio um, in the last five years. And third, uh, Russian arms producers seems to be struggling to keep their dominant position in, in the Asian market. Uh, and although it is positive that uh, uh, Russia has increased uh, its market share uh, elsewhere, like uh, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, this market, as far as I've understood, has uh, a higher level of competition, and therefore it may be more difficult to link arms transfer to um, political conditions um, there. 
Uh, all this said, uh, I agree with you that Russia's log Russia has a, still has a large contract portfolio. That means that Russia's arms producers are likely to continue to occupy an important position in the global arms market for th in the upcoming years. Um, and also, let's not forget that Russia is still the only country that matches the US uh, ability to be competitive across a wide range of weapon systems. Um, from a Western perspective, I think it's also worth remembering that even if the Russian defense industry may struggle to keep up technologically um, uh, with world leaders, Russia is still likely to remain to be seen as a reliable source of weapon, including highly advanced systems, for countries that do not enjoy a warm relationship with the United States. Thank you. Thank you. I think we, we just now quickly re reorganize ourselves and uh, invite Ruslan and Konstantin up to the stage. And then maybe give you start up with giving you and possibly Konstantin a chance to respond to Una's comments before we open up the Я буду говорить по-русски, переведет. Необходимо немножко сказать об Индии, о том, что происходило на индийском рынке в последние пять лет, или даже больше, ну туда в пять лет. It's important to give an overview what uh, was going on in India last five years, let's say. Действительно, последний крупный, вот до октября 2018 -го года, последний крупный па пакет контрактов был подписан в декабре 2012 -го года. Before the splash of 2018 October, the last big contract uh, was signed in December 2012. Вот в этот период Индия э, продолжала очень крупные закупки западных систем вооружений. Прежде всего, это гигантский контракт на Арафале на 8 миллиардов евро. During this period, India was keep contracting uh, weapons from other sources other than Russia, including the mega contract for 8 billion US dollars for euros, uh, euros for Rafal uh, multifunctional aircraft India from France. закупала крупные партии военно-транспортных патрульных uh, самолетов и, и вертолетов ударных и военно-транспортных в Соединенных Штатах. Helicopters, both attack and uh, transport uh, helicopters from United States and uh, military transport aircraft uh, and uh, military but maritime patrol aircraft from United States, big хот... contracts, Хотя big money. индийский рынок всегда был диверсифицированный, и индийский спрос всегда был диверсифицированный, но вот такой длительный период отсутствия крупных закупок в России породил у нас э, даже опасения о переориентации Индии на западные системы вооружения. India was always a market with diverse suppliers. Uh, almost every supplier apart from China was present at this country, but uh, such pose uh, such long pose, such long pose uh, triggered some kind of uh, attitude that we are losing India, that India basically uh, is not interested to buy new weapon and uh, cooperate in the area of Все это происходило на фоне хонимун такого с Соединенными Штатами. То есть в Индии существовала однозначно некая эйфория от сближения с Соединенными Штатами. Apart from general rapprochement with India, they had some kind of euphoria of this rapprochement with the United States, kind of honeymoon, and they thought that they will get some performance systems from them. И второе, на фоне очень быстрого экономического роста у индийцев возникло ощущение, как мы сейчас понимаем, ложное, ошибочное ощущение, что они могут покупать гораздо более дорогие, более высокотехнологичные, но гораздо более дорогие западные системы. This um, economic growth in India, the, uh, the new uh, political party which came after Congress, and in general this sign that it's time of India that it's not Asia-Pacific anymore, but Indo-Pacific, uh, gave them uh, impression, which now we think they understand that it's false, that they can contracting expensive systems from United States and from the world basically at the same pace as they were contracting not expensive or less expensive systems from Russia. На самом деле, оба подхода оказались, как показала сейчас история, несколько ошибочными. Ну, например, да, индийцы купили 36 истребителей Rafale, но вообще-то по их планам они должны были купить 126 истребителей. Basically, both uh, forecast, both uh, intellectual exercise how it will be was turned wrong. For example, yes, Indians bought 36 
uh, French aircraft but in f for a huge sum of money. But in fact, from the beginning, they wanted to buy 126 for the same money. И у них денег не осталось ни на закупку в России пятого поколения, ни на поддержание парка в размере 42 эскадрильи, как они хотели. And basically they uh, were obliged in a sense either refuse or to postpone idea to have fifth generation aircraft, which they were planned developing with okay. Russia, neither to have uh, a big number of combat ready aircraft which themselves think are necessary to dominate uh, in, in a potential war with Pakistan and China. По касаясь Соединенных Штатов, то вот чтобы проиллюстрировать вам атмосферу ожиданий индийских от Соединенных Штатов, я вам скажу, что в декабре 2012 года один серьезный индийский политолог нам с Русланом утверждал, заявил, что в течение года или двух Соединенные Штаты предложат Индии атомную подводную лодку. Yeah, to give you uh, the, the feeling of this euphoria, which was an Indian political circle, expert circle, uh, in December 2012, we had an interaction with very famous Indian pandit, let's call it like this, and he seriously insisted on the fact that within the next 12-24 months, Americans will offer them nuclear-powered submarine. He was serious, he was sure that this political rapprochement will lead to, to such important deal. Ну вот сейчас 6 лет спустя, я думаю, индийцы уже поняли, что американцы это на самом деле очень трудный партнёр. Indians uh, after these 6 years of uh, great expectations understand that United States in terms of technology transfer is very hard partner. Вы, кстати, в Норвегии должны понимать, you know we should have understand those who <laughs> who deal with Americans in procurement. Американская техника, конечно, очень высокотехнологична. Это серьезная страна. Американское вооружение очень серьезное, но только вы не всегда можете, практически никогда не можете быть уверенным в том, что вы имеете полный аксесс к возможностям этого вооружения. No doubt that United States uh, main battle systems are very performant, they are very deadly, and uh, it's very good to have them in your inventory. But to tell the truth, uh, you never know that you control this weaponry, uh, at least fully. Пока речь идет о военно-транспортных самолетах, с этим можно мириться, а вот если покупать боевые системы, When it comes to non-critical uh, military systems, like, like, let's say, military transport aircraft, it's okay, but when it comes uh, to important uh, combat systems, like uh, multifunctional fighter, it's a big question mark whether you would be happy. Я думаю, что к октябрю 2018 года индийцы созрели и поняли, что, в общем, без России трудно. I think by the 2018 October they uh, understand that uh, without Russia they will not be able to follow their ambitions and they signed the contract. От себя могу добавить from me я, I... я просто еще mm -hmm. последнюю фразу, хотя в презентации были упомянуты только контракт на S400 и на фрегаты Тальвар класс, на самом деле с октября 2018 года по настоящее время индийцы арендовали в Россию третью атомную подводную лодку. Apart from these two big contracts which was um, uh, shown uh, in the presentation as 400 and two Talwar class frigates, they also took into leasing second nuclear propelled submarine. Они разблокировали средства или зарезервировали средства на закупку 500 танков Т-90. They basically took a decision and uh, allocated funds to buy uh, almost 500 main battle tanks. И они присудили победу в тендере на Менпад с российским системам. And after three major events, yeah, after uh, after certain uh, time of pause, uh, they also chose Russian manually portable air defense systems. Uh, so quite a huge number. От себя могу сказать, Пару, что... А, ну, это для тебя. <laughs> От себя могу сказать, что это было подписано в октябре 2018 -го года во время визита Владимира Владимировича. У него день рождения в октябре 2018 -го года, поэтому это был индийский подарок. From myself, I can add that probably it was an Indian present to our leader, because uh, it was signed during the annual visit to India in October 2018, and uh, Vladimir Putin celebrates its birthday in October. Ну, если это так, то подарок стоимостью 5 миллиардов долларов это неплохо. Причем это подарок не Путину, а стране. 
we should, before we open the floor, as I said, uh, let you have a chance to uh, elaborate um, a little bit on some of the comments from UNA, and, and then we'll open up the floor. For <laughs> In fact, almost on every point of UNA, we can elaborate for... Uh, only on one point was elaborating for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's why we will not give <laughs> a possibility to people to express. That's why I, I, I haven't gone to offer. Let's go to the floor, and if with time yes, I would elaborate. So let's, let's hear it from the floor then, if... if uh, there are some comments or questions. Yes, and please introduce yourself, Christian. And please use the microphone. Thank you, Christian Ortland from FFI. Thank you all three for inter interesting uh, reflection, uh, re reflections. I was wondering if, Ruslan, if you could uh, say a few words about the impact of Russia's war in Syria on Russian arms exports. Back in 2015, when this war started, many believed that Syria would serve not only as a test bed for Russian weapon systems, but also as a sort of display window where they could demonstrate their most modern uh, weapon systems, um, missiles, fighter aircraft, tanks, and so on. Um, and that this could sort of boost uh, Russian arms exports, not only to countries in the region, but also to countries uh, globally. Has there been such an effect? Has this sort of expectation materialized? Я бы сказал так, в техническом смысле, в технологическом смысле практически никакого импакта не было, потому что сирийская компания очень своеобразная, там применялись очень своеобразные системы, например, Су-34, бомбардировщик, который, ну, я не вижу стран, которые могут интересоваться этой очень своеобразной машиной. So if we take Syria as a really testing ground, uh, which showed something extraordinary to those who never seen it before, done by Russians, no. Yeah, because when we was using the systems which were not tailored for that type of war. That war is very particular, yeah? If we consider Syria as a kind of ground to take, but politically... We are absolutely sure that would not would be no contracts uh, of Saudi Arabia and certain uh, countries if they haven't seen the decisive move of Russia and Syria. То есть Россия э, зафиксировала себя э, в этом регионе как э, важнейшего игрока, игрока, с, э, который ведет себя очень жестко, который ведет войну вообще-то так, игрока, который в состоянии бросить вызов одновременно Соединенным Штатам, арабским монархиям, so консервативным uh, монархиям. Политически uh, uh, Россия showed its willingness. Uh, to take challenge, and not one challenge, but several challenges at the same time, and basically dare to contradict not only to the oil monarchies of Gulf, uh, but also United States, in a sense, unified Europe, and keep it promised. So Russia promised that Assad will not go, and Assad stayed. And it's impressed many people. And uh, that's probably not the behavior which impressed people here in Norway, but it definitely impresses people in the Middle East. They like the strong man. Uh, Konstantin elaborated on why the, the pause in, in, in uh, the Indian case. You also mentioned in your presentation, Ruslan, that there was a uh, long pause uh, when it came to, to China. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. could, you, could you say a few words about why, right, why we... Uh, I will... There? As George Marche said once to his journalist, ce n'est pas votre question, mais c'est ma réponse. So I will tell you later about Algeria, because it's <laughs> extremely interesting. <laughs> but as for China, Constantine wrote a book on China, I passed flow to him, you know. On some deal, Китай был крупнейшим покупателем российских вооружений до 2006 года. В седьмом году она уступила, Китай уступил первое место Индии. И затем были моменты, когда Китай выпадал даже из первой пятерки. На самом деле, в 2007 году китайцы практически все умели делать, все, что им нужно. By 2007, uh, all what they want to have uh, in their inventory, they already knew to do themselves. Особенно потрясают их uh, военно-морское строительство. Yeah, просто потрясающе. Uh, 
А вот почему они вернулись, это более серьезный и важный вопрос. Why they returned? It's a serious question. А потому что у России появилось, появились предложения, но ну, если не нового поколения, то, по крайней мере, категорически модернизированного поколения, то есть это Су-35, это на пол поколения выше, чем Су-30, и система ПВО С-400, которая на поколение выше, чем С-300. Basically, uh, Russia offered China uh, that type of systems, which was not offering before. Uh, it was more advanced, uh, if not uh, totally new, but deep modernization, uh, deep upgrade of the systems, and Chinese followed this offer. И третья причина: китайцы так и не научились делать конкурентоспособные двигатели авиационные. Они вынуждены до сих пор покупать авиационные двигатели в России, что тоже удивительно, потому что на фоне их колоссального технологического роста с двигателями они пока не справляются. Now, with all their successes uh, in their technological advances, including uh, their interesting high-tech offers, they are still weak in engine making. And basically, when you are offering an aircraft, but you are not uh, owner of the engine, mm -hmm. uh, clients are not that interested. I don't know, probably for Sweden it's okay to have uh, American. American engine in, in their gripping, but not, not in Chinese case, you know. Uh, that, that's why... Uh, ну и самое, also think it's, it's и самое интересное, продолжат они закупки сухих 35 S400 или они сумеют скопировать их? Вот это очень интересно. Yeah, the вопрос. question the, uh, of reverse engineering, it's not only America and Europe uh, with their non-military technologies who suffer from China not respecting intellectual property right, but also us. I remember we was talking with uh, general designer uh, of Suhoi, Mikhail Pogosyan, and we told him that they are stealing what to do. He said, you can't fight with this. You should be always in ahead in innovation. This is the only way to cope with Chinese cloning your weapons. Otherwise, and the, uh, Konstantin comment that it would be interesting to see whether they will keep contracting S-400 mm -hmm. and Su-35, or they will stay with this initial batch and will do reverse engineering again. Next question will be Yulia, my colleague. Willemsen, I'm with Nupi. So since you didn't answer any of Una's excellent questions, <laughs> I want to repeat the question <laughs> which I was most interested in. Uh, and that is the question of how do you think, and this is probably a bit of speculation I want from you, but how do you think the expansion of the sanctions regime will affect um, this sector in Russia? Uh, there are several ways to respond on your question. Uh, one, we can elaborate on uh, like uh, Francisc of Assisi proof of God and it will take hours. Yeah? And uh, I will give you an example. Cast as an independent watchdog is claiming that Russian uh, weapons expert will fall dramatically <laughs> for the last 15 years. We was or 20 years. We are alarming it, but it's still going up. <laughs> so we basically were not very good Sibylla, yeah, uh, or Cassandra. Uh, it, it's like first argumentation. Second, second thing, uh, when uh, during the visit of Zhou Enlai, Prime Minister of Mao Zedong to China, he was asked, uh, what is the impact of Great French Revolution on China? You remember what he answered, it's too early to say, we should wait. The same, uh, sanctions are fresh, you know? We know that there are lots of anti-sanction hype. Th there is a kind of fear from both sides. But for the time being, when before the presentation, I said, Konstantin, let's find at least four, for example, who basically got scared. For the time being, there are two examples who got scared and one delay. Uh, you should always remember that in case of S-400, uh, the previous defense secretary, all this, try to pass the message to the senators. Don't press on Turkey on abolishing S-400. It's a minor issue for US-Turkish relations, yeah? And uh, weapons purchase, it's a sovereign decision. We have no moral, physical, spiritual right to impose our will on sovereign nation. And if we manage to do it, it will fight back against us, you know? That's why it's a very good uh, case, yeah? Uh, 
uh, it's very interesting, but it's really too early to judge. Я могу добавить, что две первоклассные, ну или второклассные мировые оборонные индустрии были созданы благодаря санкциям. Одна называется Израильский военно-промышленный комплекс, вторая Юаровский военно-промышленный комплекс. То есть основные челленджи не внешние, основные э, челленджи это сумеет ли Россия внутри э, построить организацию э, и все остальное финансирование для того, чтобы ответить на эти санкции. Basically, uh, we dare to remind to the public that two interesting uh, defense industries was created due to sanctions. Sanctions were imposed on Israel, Israel created defense industry, and South Africa. Uh, sanctions were imposed, they created defense industry. And if we look, I will add from myself, if we look Russian history, let's say from the first centralized proto-Russia of Ivan III, the whole history of Russia, it's a fight for military <laughs> technological independence. And basically, Soviet Union the, collapsed the, at the peak of military technological might. The first embargo of the West was placed on the Gansian Union on the export of media and some other colored metals to Ivan III. Yeah, we used to be friends with Danes, and Ganza imposed uh, the first embargo on proto-Russia because uh, we was not producing sophisticated materials which we used for weapons, you know. That's why, in a sense, we already experienced it for 500 years, you know. Hello, my name is Abdurrahman, and I'm visiting researcher here. And my question is uh, short. Um, you know, Ruslan, you mentioned that uh, Russia increased its sales uh, within the CSTO to its uh, member states. And uh, now today's, uh, uh, like Shanghai Cooperation Organization is becoming large and large. And according to some experts, it became a NATO of East. And uh, my question is that, is there a possibility for Russia to increase its sales uh, within, this, within the framework of uh, SCO uh, to like such countries like Pakistan or other yeah, thank you. You know, uh, when I was talking about uh, countries of Russian allies, I a little bit simplified. I did not know that would be such enlightened people in public. I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. In fact, it's not only CSTO. Yeah, it's let's say post-Soviet space. Russia was ignoring for decades post-Soviet space, basically not taking them seriously, at least from that perspective. And then was a huge contract with uh, Azerbaijan, with a good money, mm -hmm. big contract, uh, probably not that huge, but still tangible contract with uh, Turkmenistan, now Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan. So it's not only uh, Russian military allies who are unable to pay, let's put it blankly, like uh, Belarus and, uh, and Armenia, uh, but it's, it's the countries of its near broad, as we used to say in Russia. Yeah? Returning to your question about Shanghai cooperation, Russia is all this comfortable bilateral. Ru Rus Russia is not very happy multilateral, at least in these terms. That's why if would be certain breakthrough with Pakistan, it will not be because Pakistan joined Shanghai cooperation treaty, although India followed to block you know, any, uh, any developments, yeah? And uh, Russia's return to China or China uh, wish to buy from Russia again, it's not because of Shanghai Cooperation Treaty. So to our mind, at least we fail to detect the connection between multilateral forums and bilateral arms trade. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to disappoint you. As I cannot see any more hands here for the moment, uh, okay. Sorry, then <laughs> then I'll wait with my question and I'll go uh, in the back first. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Turban Holt. Uh, I'm here oh, just personal interest. I'm not. I'm a pensioner, but I travel a little bit in Russia, so I'm a little bit curious about different things. So my first question is really <coughs> uh, to you: How do you, when you collect information at, in cast at your work, is it free to collect all information? in an arms industry, both internally and, and externally from international. That was my, uh, my first question. Second is really, I know we touched it, but uh, it uh, goes uh, regarding the, um, 
let's say, the development of uh, advanced uh, weapons for the future. It's, it's you go into a more digitalization uh, world, you know, advanced weapons. Uh, are will do you think for the future Russia will be able to catch up with the West on this area, and also uh, regarding China as a uh, future opponent in this respect? Five questions in one, like Matryoshka question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I will <laughs> respond on one. On, on some and Konstantin on some other. Понял вопрос или нет? Первый только понял. Нет, я на первый отвечу <coughs> по информации, да? Ну давай отвечай. Значит, что касается информации, вот цифры, которые мы давали, это официальные цифры. То есть это цифры, которые озвучу, обнародуются либо президентом, либо директором федеральной службы по военно-техническому сотрудничеству, либо однажды это помощник президента по военно So as for data, uh, presentation was made uh, on official data and partially on press. Yeah? Uh, in, in terms of arms trade, Russia is partially or relatively open. Yeah? Я думаю, только французы более подробные доклады, доклад, подробные. немцы очень подробные доклады делают. Но вот Соединенные Штаты, например, более закрытая страна, yeah. они, они публикуют It's хорошие... paradoxical that as for Russia, there are more open countries, more transparent countries in the area of arms production and arms trade. It's like Nordic countries, Germany, France. But for example, the statistics of the United States is worse than Russian one. The United States are more closed in this area. В последнее время в связи с применением закона КАЦ информации будет становиться все меньше, но если, например, речи... в этом смысле КАЦ будет более пострадавшим, может быть, чем, чем вся Россия. Yeah, I think we will feel this uh, diminishing of open data. Но Due to Katsa and Russia, Russia's measures to combat Katsa. Глядите, Индия — это крупнейший покупатель, ну, или страна, которая снова стала крупнейшим покупателем. Индия — это открытая страна, там все открыто. But when we are returning to Russian clients, India is a democracy, it's an open country. Uh, if you don't know certain information from Russian side, you will know it's from Indian side. Второе, есть страны, которые, конечно, очень закрыты. Тот же Египет, Алжир. There are countries which are closed, like Algeria, like Egypt, Myanmar. Только сейчас у каждого филлаха есть uh, вот такой вот девайс. But people now have this device and they make pictures and they put them online. Как только есть World changed. Понятно, что когда, когда есть какие-то модернизационные solutions или там передача математических каких-то моделей, это не, невозможно детектировать. When you're Но speaking если... about intangible technology, software, you know, consultations, but when но когда пла платформа передается. Есть еще, например, так, так, такой источник информации, как информация флайт-радара. Допустим, если вы видите, что из города Луховицы... There is an open uh, platform, it calls flight radar, then it's, it tracks uh, aircraft. And when you see big, huge transport aircraft transporting something, из Луховицы. From Луховицы City, where MiG-29... Есть, есть два uh, варианта. Yeah. Это либо MiG-29, либо MiG потому что в Луховицах завод по производству MiG-29, либо огурцы, потому что в Луховицах очень, <laughs> очень вкусные огурцы выращивают. Basically, there are two sources. They make... Uh, they, they do final assembly of fighter jets and they produce cucumbers. That's why it's, yeah, it's either MiG-29 or it's cucumbers. And since we're analysts, we opt for MiG-29. <laughs> Ну, то есть, конечно, нам, неправительственным людям, нам информации всегда мало. Но мы не чувствуем сейчас какой-то критической ситуации. It's, it's in this country, you can read books about Norwegian special operation forces. There is no of them uh, in Egypt, but there are video and there are photo. And there are people who are able, simply by interpreting video and photo, write a coherent text. So the, the way how information uh, appears and how you can sum information is different now than, let's say, in the Cold War period. And it makes life... For some people, more complicated. For some people, more easy. Like for us. That was the first part of the I'll yeah. question. I, but I just, uh, you know, also yeah. wanted to I just add a little here. comment from a Western perspective, because um, um, when you study Russia uh, from the West, one of the main, main changes that I, uh, challenges that I find is that 
it's not a, the lack of information, there's the amount of it. <laughs> there's so much, so you really, you really have a hard time to figure out what you want to know uh, or where to get it. But usually you can, there's a lot of data you can find um, You're drowning when you in only know where to look for it. Yeah. That's true. This is the phenomena. In Cold War, people were trying to get information. Now you're drowning in it and you need to get rid of certain. No, I don't need this for my analysis. It's too much. Yeah? There is saturation. Uh, second part. Uh, uh, so se the second Matryoshka. part was on di 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 digitalization. Yeah? Uh, you know, uh, uh, since we are political scientists and I even with a journalist background, that's why I will give you a collateral response. From one point of view, it looks very important. But from another point of view, we hear there is lots of hype about digitalization. You remember like 15 years ago, everybody was speaking about Segway, that Segway will save, save the world, or some other gadget will save the world. Then hype passed, and we basically, uh, ba basically were not saved, or it hasn't changed the world, yeah? Uh, gadgets. Internet really changed the world, yeah? But whether, I know Tour will disagree seriously, whether the Tesla cars in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the downtown of uh, Oslo changed the, your way of consumption, although Musk present himself and his things as something revolutionary. So from one point of view, at least my perception, that it will have impact, like artificial intelligence, additive technology, yeah? But there are too much hype of digitalization and its impact on military production and military affairs. I don't know whether you satisfied with the answer, but yeah, yeah, but I, uh, yeah, but I don't have a crystal ball, you know, and unable to see. And there was a third Matryoshka, but I already forgot. Ah, China, you know, I try to uh, tell you that there is always a fear of China in Russia for centuries, simply because it's a big territory and there are a lot of them, yeah? And we have big territory and there are less of us. But if you uh, step slightly back from this almost Freudian fray, uh, uh, perception, Freudian fears, yeah? Basically it's almost uh, Chinese never basically attacked its neighbors, they were subject of attack, yeah. Uh, Chinese never colonized in an aggressive way, they were subject of colonization. And uh, it's, not, it's not racist, but basically they like when it is hot. That's why I mostly believe them uh, interested in Taiwan than uh, in, in Siberia where it's, ho where it's cold, yeah, w once again. I personally, as an analyst, don't see any Chinese threat. Более того, северо-восточные, да, северо-восточные провинции Китая наоборот страдают от оттока населения. They say that uh, some provinces of uh, of China, neighboring with us, they there there is a problem of drain of people who are migrating from this relatively hostile for daily living areas to 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 a nicer parts of China. That's why. I personally don't see any threat of, I don't know, Chinese migrants come and it became Chinese and so on and so forth. Uh, I know that this is an unpleasant dream of some Western uh, analysts uh, that Russia together with China against the United States. Recently was uh, a conference in Tallinn, some of our friends were there and there were two narratives. First narrative was Putin is evil. We all know it, what's new, yeah? And second one, they never paid attention in Tallinn on China for decades, and suddenly they paid attention and said, this is extremely dangerous for the democracies if Putin and Xi Jinping together will join their effort, jeopardize, I don't know, Baltic democracy, <laughs> American way of life, so on and so forth. Yeah. I don't know what's the response, but yeah. Next question on my list is from Tur. Just very shortly, if you can uh, comment on how the Russian arms industry has accommodated to the break of relations with Ukraine in terms of the things you cannot longer, long, no longer get from Ukraine. Good question. Pro-Ukraine, Otilia. 
Ты же у нас Лукиенко, как, 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 как российская промышленность. Как, да, как отреагировала на, на разрыв с Украиной. Импортозамещением. Украина обладала технологией, двумя критическими технологиями. Обладала, обладает. So Russia двумя... initiated process of import substitution, and in case of the Ukraine, Ukraine had two crucial technologies. Первое — это производство двигателей для вертолетов, моторов для вертолетов. No, helicopter propulsion. В прошлом году Климов произвел 150, ну, более 150 вертол... вертолетных двигателей. So Russia had a design bureau, but not serial production. Uh, but uh, within this five-year period, uh, Russia managed to increase number of locally produced engines, and now it, the ratio is 150. So the real problem was gas turbine propulsion uh, for ships, naval propulsion, and it was uh, third in the world, I can add, General Electric, uh, Rolls-Royce, and... Совет, Совет Украины. Кстати, буквально на несколько суток спустя, там, на второй или третьей сутки после ну, того, что вы, наверное, здесь называете демократическим выбором или как это, демократической революцией и тем, что мы в России предпочитаем называть государственным переворотом, СБУ взяла под контроль именно Николаевский завод. Yeah, the funny thing is probably coincidence that next uh, two, three days after uh, democratic upheaval slash Uh, anti-constitutional coup in Kiev in 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, some call it, yeah, uh, revolution of dignity, yeah. Uh, the law enforcement agencies took control of this plant. And because uh, there was a, uh, engines ready to export uh, to Russia. So in, in Rybinsk uh, was a plant uh, where they start to... Saturn. Saturn, where they start to produce already before uh, this, uh, this uh, gas turbine engines, uh, and they increase the pace and... Ukraine не производит ничего того, чего не могла бы производить Россия. Украина э, производит советские технологии, ВОЗ производит советские технологии 70-х, 80-х годов. Basically, В этом нет ничего сакрального. And uh, most of its legacy is 70s and 80s, yeah, uh, late 70s, beginning of 80s. So this is not something extremely sophisticated. This is all doable. Uh, I can't really see. Is it 10 minutes? Yeah, 12 minutes left. So we have uh, room for more questions, or I will again try to return to, <laughs> <laughs> to Una's uh, comments, uh, because you said something about, you, you asked about various trends for various types of, of uh, weapon systems in the future. Will you, could you say something more about that? I remember Una yeah. rightly pointed that uh, then there was no internal demand, export went up, and then there is a relatively big demand from local armed forces, and at the same time you need to feed your own armed forces, which is supposed to be a priority, but since they pay not as well as uh, foreign customers, and you're supposed to deal with them, how to reconcile this? Yeah, basically, the, the, I think this is very important, uh, important point. Uh, Russia is um, tackling these uh, things, I think, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Let's look Turkey. From the beginning, it was constructed the delivery two years further down. But since Erdogan insisted, uh, it's not uh, explained, but I think uh, Russian armed forces basically agreed to wait a little bit. It reminds me of the situation then Shah of Iran, who was basically uh, weapons drug addicted, he paid so much to the United States that F-14 first came to Shah inventory and then to U.S. Uh, armed forces. So such, such cases uh, happens in the world, yeah? When we are speaking about other issues, yeah? For example, uh, main battle tanks, you know? If there is a demand for main battle tanks, yeah? Uh, Russia basically now either do upgrade of T-72 or making effort on the next generation, yeah? That, that's why in, in every case you're kind of dodging trying to satisfy uh, the local demand and, uh, and, and foreign customer. 
the main bottleneck, this is S-400, and uh, probably certain other missile systems like um, naval air defense. I uh, думаю, S-400. So, 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 like, this problem exists, but it's not that sharp as we basically thought at the beginning, because we thought that would be really a block. Since Soviet time, there are huge facilities. Imagine uh, the war four plants to producing main battle tanks. <laughs> one was in St. Petersburg, Rybachev closed it. One was in Kharkov, one was in Omsk, and one's, one was in, uh, in Nizhny Tagil. Only main battle tanks. <laughs> we are not speaking uh, on some other type of uh, vehicles on with caterpillars because there were other plants. Last chance to dig into the brains. I will probably add uh, about Algeria. Yeah, yep. uh, it's very interesting <laughs> case that, that yes. uh, Algerian uh, Algerian oil revenues goes down. The economy very much reminds. Soviet Union and Iran, state-run, not very efficient holdings, but they keep buying at a huge pace. I think this is an inevitable uh, uh, consequences of Western operation in Libya. Basically, after West came with a sword uh, and with a fire to change identity of, uh, of Libya, Algerian rulers both uh, political and military, they applied it to them. Next, they will come to us. Yeah, and uh, since they already proved uh, that they are potent military, we all remember the bloody civil war and how decisive they were to uh, to face insurgency. Despite that, they have much less money. They prepare to fight back the West aggression. Real or imaginary, no matter. Более того, в 2007-2008 году были признаки того, что Алжир готов начать крупные закупки западных систем вооружений. Yeah, in 2007 and 2008 we we saw certain we detected certain sign that. Ну, собственно, и контракты были уже. And there were contracts that Algeria basically was interested in certain Western equipment. После десятого они покупают yeah, but, в основном в России yeah, и в Китае. Basically, after, after Libya case, they totally return to Russia and to, uh, to China. Что мы, вероятно, должны сказать большое спасибо господину Саркази. Which we get a translation Supposed to be Sarkozy, grateful yeah. to Sarkozy and yeah. <laughs> those who supported his intervention in Libya. Okay, on that note, if you know. On that note, I would like to uh, thank uh, Ruslan and, and Konstantin for, for sharing their insights on, on the future of uh, the arms trade and the arms industry in, in, in Russia. And, and thank uh, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment for uh, uh, helping out with organizing this event. And thank you to you, of course. Thank you for your time and patience. Thank you.